Hey folks, good morning, good afternoon. This is Jeff Beston, Beston with Stefan Scheicher. We are at the hour and uh, we are not gonna start. We're gonna give folks another minute to join. We got a lot of people coming in. Uh, to be honest, I have never been early to a webinar, so I don't know why I should expect anybody else. We'll give it another 60 seconds to let uh, the folks come in and then we will begin. So thank you for joining. Hang in there, we'll get started shortly. All right, hello everybody. Stefan, why don't you join me as well? We'll kick things off. I wanna thank everyone for attending today. We were pleased to uh, launch the landscape two days ago. And today is our opportunity to formally walk you through the digital interactivity landscape and actually dive in a little bit and talk about each interactive modality, discuss its strengths and weaknesses, that sort of thing. Uh, I am Jeff Beston, I'm with Intuaface. I am their CMO and platform evangelist. Uh, and Stefan, if you can introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Stefan Schieke from um, Invitus Consulting, a Munich-based, Munich-Germany-based uh, consulting firm. We're focusing on digital signage and digital retail. Um, and next to our consulting business, we also have a, a news portal on, on the topic. And we also organize conferences like uh, Digital Signage Summit, uh, DSS uh, over here in Europe. And we work a lot with ISE. Thank you, Stefan. We, Intuitface is very excited to work with Invitus. They're uh, not just well known in the industry, but they do have a, a Bible that they publish once a year. And we thought the poster is a perfect example of something uh, that would be great for this sort of annual release. So we'll be joined by Stefan in a little bit, Stefan. So thank you. We'll see you in a bit. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I don't need glasses. I'm just putting them on because they are sexy. Um, Intuaface has been in the business of enabling companies to adopt digital interactivity for years. That's why we exist. And we have trouble keeping track of the different interactive options and all of the vendors supplying technology for those options. So can you imagine the difficulty for the retailer, the museum, uh, the workplace, the trade show, all of these companies trying to innovate, to adopt new and interesting and engaging interactive technologies and Googling, you know, how are they finding these companies? And we have sympathies for the vendors who are trying to promote what is very often very innovative technology, and it's hard to find them. It is a large, fractured, diverse collection of technologies and companies. And we thought, can we do something about that? Is there a way to provide a living snapshot of the companies providing technology that can trigger a response in out of home and digital signage content. And that's what the interactivity landscape is about. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this webinar. So to do that, we'll begin with a look at the digital interactivity landscape. Uh, we will then spend a moment with Stefan talking about the critical ingredients for successful interaction. Uh, I will then dive into each individual category and talk about the strengths and weaknesses of these different types of interaction. And then we'll have a Q&A. And I don't see my toolbar, so I wanna make sure we're good. Okay, better. So I don't wanna make sure everybody can see what I see. Good. So let's begin with the landscape. Uh, this is the current version of the landscape. So I mentioned we launched this uh, two days ago, and we're already in the third version since the launch. Uh, we have worked very hard, and Tua Face and Avidus have worked very hard to identify as comprehensively as possible the players across these different categories. And uh, I'm sure we missed somebody, you know. Uh, so it's very important to make this a living document. You'll notice in the bottom right, we do have a date stamp, so last updated. We will make sure that this is as current as possible because that's what's fair to the vendors. Uh, we expect this poster to have some traction, uh, to be used by agencies and integrators, by, by the end user, to help them identify players, 
and it's not fair to vendors to be left off the list because we didn't update it. Uh, so we will update this as frequently as possible. Uh, there is a downloadable version in PDF that actually has a link to each vendor. You click the logo, it takes you to their website. So we're going to return to each one of these categories, talk about their strengths and weaknesses. I'm not going to run through all 130 companies. Uh, but there are nine categories, over 130 companies. We certainly expect that to grow. Unfortunately, in this economy, maybe a couple will disappear as well. Let's hope not. Uh, but it is published, as I said, on an as-needed basis, and it is totally free for download. Uh, you can scan in that QR code. You can go to that URL. Uh, either way, you'll find the landscape in image or PDF form. If you download it for free, you don't have to fill out a form, give us an email address, and use it however you wish. You can distribute it. You know, Just don't mess with it, but you can distribute it. And as promised, we will continue to update it as often as we think is necessary. We've even identified maybe a new category or two that we think perhaps we'll add. Uh, so this is a really interesting project for us too, to be working on that. Uh, just a moment about the listing requirements. Why these companies, okay? Well, first, uh, to be a member of this poster, we believe the tech, they, they're selling a technology that recognizes an explicit or implicit human action. Explicit is they touched, they said something, they made a gesture. They intended to express their desire using some kind, some kind of thing, some kind of action. An implicit action means, well, they didn't intend to do it, but they did anyway, like computer vision, right? Or motion sensors. That wasn't an explicit action. I wasn't trying to activate the motion sensor, but because I was there walking in front of the screen, I triggered an event and that changed content on screen. So. Uh, either explicit or implicit human action. Uh, also, to be a member of the poster, it has to be CMS neutral. This is not about Intuaface and our software. I'm not trying to pump Intuaface even in this webinar. The point of the poster is that these technologies can, in theory, be used with any digital signage CMS, any content management system. If there is technology that is kicks ass, it's awesome at what it does, but it's for a specific CMS, we're not going to list it here. The spirit of this landscape is that it is CMS neutral. Uh, finally, that technology needs to be positioned, at least in part, for use in digital signage. And I'll give you an example. There are lots of companies out there providing uh, some sort of a speech recognition capability that is entirely focused on call centers. And it's great technology and it works beautifully and we're very impressed, but it's not on the poster because it is not intended to be used with signage. Now, maybe they'll pivot. Maybe they'll extend it, maybe they'll reposition, right? In which case, okay, great, they can be part of the poster. But if currently that's not how they're positioned, that's not their business model, it's not in the poster. If at any point you feel that you or some company you know should be listed, if there needs to be some sort of change, if you have an idea for a new category, either email uh, Intuaface at landscape at intuaface.com or email Invitus at info at invitus.de, let us know, we'll evaluate your suggestion, and if it works, it's probably updated the next business day, okay? Great, uh, next up, we're gonna take a big picture look at digital interactivity in that physical space, sort of critical ingredients for successful interaction, and for that, I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Stefan. Yes, thanks a lot, Jeff. And um, as you said, on critical ingredients, uh, it's what I'm talking about now. It's not going to be a comprehensive uh, cookbook um, of actually how to design a successful interaction. But I wanted to make sure that uh, if you think about using um, interactive digital signage, uh, there's a couple of points uh, to consider. And um, I mean, if, um, Geoff, if you could um, switch to the next page, um, the by far um, the most common um, inter touch, uh, interface um, we see out there is still touch. Even with the pandemic um, and people are more afraid of touching um, screens that's, that are in public, um, we still see it as the dominant interface and it even goes so far that uh, if you put up a screen in, in public and it's not a touch screen, uh, some companies like this one in Asia um, need to put on uh, note that this is not a touch screen. People got so used uh, to touching screens with their uh, own mobile devices 
um, that they expect kind of this interaction and it's become very, very natural over the past 10, 12 years uh, that it's been around. So, um, and that, that's, if you look on the poster, um, there's a lot of companies uh, offering different touch technologies um, and uh, there, there's a reason for that because um, it is dominant interface. So, um, but with the pandemic um, and even before, um, people started thinking about um, other forms of, of uh, interaction with screens or with digital um, um, devices. And uh, we, we have a whole lot of them. And um, there, there's uh, things like uh, tracking gestures, uh, tracking hands, tracking body position, um, tracking markers, um, tracking even tracking eyes and, and speaking to devices. And Joff, if you go to the next page, please. Um, that, but what's very, very important, if you use one of those uh, new novel um, interfaces, um, you, make, you have to make people aware that they can interact with your device. And uh, people are just not uh, so much used to speak to the screen, for example. They, they might be used to uh, speaking to, their, uh, to Alexa or to Siri at home or on their phone. Um, but they are uh, not used to speaking to screens, uh, especially in public. So make sure if you offer um, alternative uh, means of, of interaction um, that you let people know that there needs to be call to action. You have to explain that, um, that's, that you can actually talk to a screen or um, wave in front of a screen and uh, trigger an interaction that way. And um, that brings me to, to my next point. Uh, Geoff, if you could go to the next slide. Um, the interactions um, you're providing have to be very, very natural. So if there's a context uh, where touch makes most sense, you probably want to use touch. And you should, even though people might be afraid of using it, um, but there are other contexts. I, um, in, in this case, uh, we had an example of a fitting room. And uh, that's a great place where you can um, use voice interaction because it's a, a semi-private environment and there people feel comfortable talking to a device and getting support um, by talking uh, to, to a screen or, or device, getting help, getting different sizes. Um, so this is a context where um, speech interaction works very well. The same, same thing, speech interaction, um, for example, at a telemachine um, in, in a public space doesn't work. It's not the natural means of, uh, of interacting with that device. And people are actually not afraid of talking to the, um, to the device. They're usually afraid of getting an answer from the device. So if you ask uh, your, your bank balance, uh, you, I mean, you don't know what you're getting back. Um, is it very loud and uh, is everybody around you uh, going to know your, your bank balance? You, you don't have any money uh, left in the account. That's something you don't want to have. So um, if you design um, interactions and uh, if you're using these different technologies, make sure um, that you are aware of the context where it's happening and make sure that this is really a, a very, very natural way um, to use your service or to, to trigger that, um, that in interaction. And that's very different from your mobile device because um, there you can control the context and there it's mostly about uh, really the, the right uh, design on, on, your, um, on your phone. Um, but here it's really about uh, designing the right interaction for the context uh, where your device is, uh, is, is placed. So Jeff, if you could go to the next slide, please. And um, on here, we have an example um, of German Railway. Um, they played around um, with, a, um, with a robot, which could actually help you finding coffee, but also help you with your uh, travel needs. And they just decided for a couple of things uh, in, in creating this interaction. For once, they wanted to make it more human. So they used that robot with a, um, with a projected face on it. So this feels more natural and you, you're feeling like uh, talking to a real person. So that helps a lot in this voice communication. 
but for some of the information that they provide, they um, also saw that they needed a display. So you can see the little tablets um, that's placed below um, the, the face. Um, so they have several means of interacting with that service. So you can touch the display, you can get some information from the touch display where it's appropriate, but you can also talk um, to the robot. And yeah, Jeff, you, you can go on. So sometimes it's a combination of, of these things. And um, interactions are typically not a one-way street. And the example I put in here um, is a, actually a gaze tracking example. So you can see the little Toby eye tracker that's sitting below the, um, the lower screen here. And what we did there is actually um, used that gaze tracking um, to trigger um, a couple of interactions on the screen. But what's for us much, much more interesting is the information you're getting back. It's very, very um, interesting to learn where people are looking at. So for example, they use this technology um, to control a fashion shop. And uh, you didn't have to put in your um, the, the clothes you're looking for, you just had to look at the red sweaters and after a while the screen only showed you red sweaters. Um, so you can use the um, information you're getting back from these interactions. That's generating data and that's generating a lot of learning opportunities. So don't, don't see um, these technologies as a one-way street just to get the reaction of a user and trigger some, some events, but also see it as an opportunity to create data and um, and uh, insights. And Jeff, if you can could go to the last slide, please. Um, and sometimes it's uh, the creative use of, of technologies, and that's probably not something that's on our list, um, but this is a, an example from Nike in New York City. Um, they just used this uh, old phone booth um, to actually uh, trigger a selfie interaction. So you could pick up that phone, and you can see the little camera above it. Um, and if once you, you hang up the phone, um, the camera is actually taking a picture of you and sending it off to your, uh, to your mobile device. So this is also a form of interaction. And uh, for, for me, it's a good example because it's, uh, it's more about uh, the creative ideas of designing um, interactions and, and user interfaces uh, than it's about technology. And um, yeah, that's, just a, a quick five, six minutes uh, overview of uh, what's out there and a couple of points um, you probably should think about when you think about using interactive technologies. Jeff, off to you. Thank you very much, Steph. You know, Stefan and his colleague Florian, they live on the road. And so one of the nice things about these guys is they're, they're literally interacting with all of these innovative deployments and uh, so every time they present they're showing you real world stuff which is uh, it, it makes it real it's excellent and, and in fact so, i'm currently sitting in in uh, the middle of switzerland and not in my office in, in munich so <laughs> i'm poor, on the road right poor now <laughs> poor guy in switzerland <laughs> uh okay so uh that's the big picture uh, sort of the the general notion of it needs to be intuitive it needs to be sensible it needs to fit uh, the purpose of that deployment, uh, which is uh, easy to say, hard to do because you get all ambitious, you have all these great ideas, but when you deploy, nobody knows what the heck you're trying to do. You have to take your audience into consideration, right? Let's dive into each individual interactivity category. Uh, just briefly, I mean, maybe I don't have to make this point, but why should we care at all? Why, why care about interactivity, right? Why not just do traditional broadcast digital signage? I'd like to think that the fact that you're here, you already understand why it matters. Because if you introduce interactivity, you get higher engagement, you increase conversion, you get data-based insight because stuff is actually happening at the screen, and you build this cutting edge appeal. So there are lots of incentives for adopting interactivity. Uh, touch is the primary modality. We'll talk about the other ones. Uh, but regardless of what you use, it brings a sense of innovation, which pulls people in, it engages them, it keeps them there longer, which ideally leads to conversion, and the whole time you're collecting data. Not just about what the person is doing, but maybe about who they are, about the environment, about the context, you're pulling all of this data in, which gives you a much better understanding of what's working, what's not working, uh, and what's best for the business and for the project. Uh, but again, maybe I'm preaching to the choir. 
certainly touch is the big guy, right? Uh, I, you know, in the United States, the CDC just last week published a report saying touch, actually not so bad. You almost have to try hard if you want to get sick through touch. Two years ago, it was about McDonald's screens and, you know, there's always some sort of knock on it. But the fact is, if I touch a screen and wash my hands, I'm fine. And the beauty of touch is that uh, everybody knows how to do it. Uh, the results are intuitive. You know what's going to happen when you do it. Uh, it's easy to express what you want. And as we're discovering, actually, it's kind of safe. And, you know, if you want to choose between touching a screen and washing your hands or talking to somebody face to face, what's safer? And, and by no means are we saying you should never talk to people anymore. But for, from a self-service perspective, is it the death of touch and everybody's going to be using an alternative modality? No. But what I do think will happen is you're going to find multimodality deployments. Some people will be uncomfortable with touch, no matter what they're told and, and what happens. And can you accommodate those? And there could be other reasons, such as accessibility. You know, if, if you have some wall-mounted screen, can somebody in a wheelchair reach it? And if not, well, that's a bad mount, but are there alternative interactive options that can accommodate these people uh, in the chair um, so they can still interact with the content? So touch will easily continue to be the primary mode of interaction. Uh, in the poster, we identify different kinds of uh, interactive technology. At the end of the day, the results are the same. Uh, at the end of the day, the user doesn't know which one it is or likely doesn't unless they're in the business. Uh, and so it's out of scope to discuss, well, one technology versus the other, but we all get touch works, pretty cool, and there's lots of companies selling that technology. Why consider the alternatives? Well, there's the, there is the safety angle. Uh, again, just because people are told it's safe, just keep your hands clean, doesn't mean, you know, we're touching doorknobs and stairwells, but we're worried about the screen, right? Uh, but okay, some people are conscious about that. There's the accessibility angle that I had mentioned for those that are physically challenged. Maybe they just don't see very well, right? Um, or they have trouble using their arms and so having very specific touch points is a challenge. Uh, suitability, there could be environmental constraints. Maybe they're not meant to reach the screen. Maybe it's some kind of exhibit or it's, a, it's an environment where there needs to be some environmental protection and so they can't physically access it. Uh, there's, of course, the novelty angle, which I think we all understand. It's cool to do something different. Uh, and then technical innovation, which is about highlighting you. So there's a novelty, the experience to engage people, but there's also the uh, aura it gives you as a brand, you as a company, that this is the kind of deployments you guys do. It doesn't look like an old Windows 95 application. It's something cool and modern. So lots of reasons to consider alternatives. Let's look at these alternatives. And we're starting with voice activation. In the upper right hand corner, we circled you know, the part of the poster. Voice activation, use of the spoken word, uh, could be complemented by text to speech. I mean, the screen could talk back to you. Uh, voice activation has been around, a lot of these technologies are not new, uh, at least from an R&D perspective, they've been around for quite a while. And a lot of text to speech, uh, the recognition, forgive me, of the spoken word, that was like dragon, uh, what was that dragon thing before? which was all about capturing your word for writing. I mean, that's kind of what initially popularized it. But there's the accessibility angle uh, where users have physical limitations. They can't reach the screen. They can't touch the screen. They can't see it very well. Well, voice activation can accommodate that. As I mentioned, maybe the displays are inaccessible or maybe your hands are just busy. Um, we, we had a customer once who wanted to lead a cooking class so the hands would be dirty, but they still wanted to advance slides in some way. And so they used uh, a variant of voice activation to make that possible. So the environment, the, the, the type of engagement just sort of argued for that. So there's some really interesting uh, use cases for voice activation. Of course, if it's a very noisy environment, that can be a challenge. Now, certainly there are microphones and technologies that try to screen all that stuff out, but depending on the deployment, it's an additional expense. It's another thing to maintain, another thing to service. Um, or it just can be so damn loud, it's just hard to hear, you know? So that could be a, a counterpoint to adoption. And then there's the, the whole perspective on precision. Now, technology is getting pretty good these days. Nevertheless, depending on the environment and, and the sort of the dwell time you feel is optimal for your deployment, um, depending on accents and the diversity of your audience, that could be potentially challenging. It's tough to test. 
uh, in house. It's you kind of just have to let it out there and test it and see how it goes. So it, it's considerations for is this right for me? Is it not something to keep in mind? And this is what we're going to do for every item in the list, which brings us to RFID and NFC, radio frequency identification, near field communication. In both cases, they're similar technologies. Uh, it's transmission of an ID. So there's there's a tag on a device in a room, you know, somewhere, and it's broadcasting an ID. <coughs> Probably has a little battery in it. Uh, and then there's a receiver that captures the ID. Uh, when would you use this? Well, there's lots of possible uses. Lift and learn. Uh, I can tell you with Intuiface, it's pretty easy to build a lift and learn scenario. You have a tagged item on a receiver. When you lift the item, the receiver can detect that the ID has been removed. It knows which item was removed because it knows the ID and triggers a video to play or something to appear on screen, right? So it's a cool example. Any kind of tour could be a museum, some kind of exhibition where you've tagged different exhibits and maybe people are traveling with some device that acts as a receiver. And every time they approach an exhibit, it picks up the ID and it shows you information about it or play some audio for you. Credentialing is an obvious one. You swipe, a, you know, wave a badge or something. The badge has the ID, right? And the door picks up that ID and uh, it says, oh, hey, Jeff, you're allowed in. Stefan, no, Stefan stays out. Price check, and I mean, you get the idea, right? So all of these different ways to leverage tags. Of course, there's more cost, right? Uh, you need to invest in the tags. You need to invest in the readers. There could be some, uh, what do you call it? You know, you're, I'm blanking on the word, but you, know, you lose a tag or something like turnover, turnover. Uh, there's damage risk. It's just one more thing that can break. So th these considerations for exclusion doesn't mean you should exclude it. It's just got to be aware of these things, right? Uh, these are considerations. Is it just easier to do touch or something like that? Well, it depends. It depends on your budget, depends on the audience, depends on the environment. Uh, so RFID and NFC, you know, they're same family, conceptually different, same, same general idea. Computer vision. So you got a camera, right? The camera is anonymously, doesn't have to be, but for the purposes of our poster, anonymous is the game. Anonymously determining age, gender, body count, attention, opportunity to see, emotional state, and more, who knows, using a live video feed captured by a camera. For some solutions, it's a 2D camera. For some solutions, it's a 3D camera. Uh, but the idea is that this is one of those implicit interactions. The person didn't want to be seen by the camera. They just are. Uh, but the camera is detecting all of these different uh, aspects of the human environment. How many people are they looking? Did they see it? Could they see it? And you can do some really cool stuff with that. Certainly context-aware advertising. Uh, in other words, uh, in real time, adjusting to the audience in front of the screen and showing content that suits the characteristics of the audience as it is in that moment. Maybe a 30-year-old female approaches the screen, so we're going to show an ad for a 30-year-old female. Or maybe it's still acting like a passive screen, a traditional broadcast screen, but it is monitoring the environment and adjusting content on the fly to appeal to that audience. Entrance flow management, you approach a store and uh, they want to, without uh, human personnel, are they wearing a mask? Is there enough room in the store? And you can use computer vision to facilitate that. Uh, glam hosted education, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, these sort of cultural institutions, uh, you could build some really cool exhibits with computer vision, right? So this is not about selling anything or promoting. This is education. This is fun. And you can do some really cool stuff with that. And uh, one of the beauties is regardless of how you use computer vision, you got data. You got a lot of cool data. Uh, so for every interaction, for every moment, you know so much about the users and so much about the environment. Uh, which could vary from location to location, from day to night, from winter to summer. I mean, all of these things could vary based on a whole different uh, contextual measures. And the camera's telling you exactly who's there and how long they looked and you know, blah, blah, blah. And so you could do some really great stuff with it. Uh, privacy is always an issue. Again, with GDPR, I mean, in, in, uh, in Europe, and then the, the states are kind of slowly getting there. California has its own privacy law. Uh, well, there's the whole opt-in aspect of GDPR, et cetera, but just in general, even sometimes people see a camera, they can freak out, you know, and I guess you can hide it, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but 
uh, it's something to consider. It's not a reason to exclude, but how much is privacy a concern? How much is it a mandate? How much do you have a legal responsibility to expose to your customers, uh, to your audience, that sort of thing? Sensors. So this is about the environment, okay? This is, could be movement, could be temperature could be light, you know, it's sensing something in the environment. It could be monitoring the level of uh, coolant in a refrigerator, I mean, any kind of sensor. So the device is activated by a change in the natural world, something has happened. Uh, you know, an easy example is a motion detector that triggers a, hey, over here, I got something for you, right? Um, or context sensitive content, context sensitive. Uh, when it's raining, do this. Uh, when the Boston Red Sox hit a home run, do this. You know, it is sensitive to context outside the bounds of just the screen. It could be a local context. It could be a global context. You know, it, you know, maybe it's just a, a stock ticker. Did it reach a certain amount? And all of these things can be used to trigger things in digital content. Uh, one reason to consider excluding it is well, how frequently is the environmental thing changing? If it's constantly changing, it's going to be hell for your deployment, right? Uh, is it unreliable? Is it inconsistent? Is it going to be wrong more than it's right? So you need to give some thought to what is it that we're measuring? How frequently is it going to change? Maybe we only poll it on an infrequent basis so we don't deal with the constant change. Is it reliable? Things you need to verify before uh, you run with it. Beacons, uh, conceptually similar to RFID NFC, far less popular until recently uh, with RFID and NFC, but conceptually kind of the same idea. It's broadcast information over a short distance. Uh, this time it's using Bluetooth rather than radio frequencies, but again, conceptually same idea. So the prime candidates are kind of the same idea. Lift and learn, curated sightseeing, credentialing, the same kind of stuff you saw with uh, the radio frequency stuff. It too has the overhead challenges one needs to consider and the damage risk that one needs to consider. Um, it's, uh, but it works. And so it's something to consider. We got a whole bunch of companies providing that. Uh, gesture. So that's non-verbal human movement for expression. Uh, I'm doing something that means, that expresses my desire. I'm not physically touching the screen. I'm in the air and I'm doing something. Uh, prime candidates for you. So this is, there's an element of simplicity here because you cannot assume the audience can do fancy gestures. They don't know sign language. So certainly in the early days of deployment, you need to think about simple things. So simple information kiosks, maybe it's just, it's simple gestures, right? Media jukebox, maybe a game of some kind, right? The challenges these days is again, because your audience cannot be expected either to know lots of gestures or to do it very accurately, you're really, can't do a complex UI, it would be a challenge. Uh, if you have a trained user that practices their gestures, okay, that's one thing. But for just some random people in a shopping mall, you probably need a simple UI. Um, are there environmental restrictions? Or how much light is there and how much exposure? Does it need to be private? Do you want people going like this in the, in the middle of a hallway? Um, and then there's the notion of, of integrity. Uh, by definition, there's additional ca there's cameras and there's there's more of a deployment uh, uh, set of requirements for gesture. And can it be bumped easy? Are they vulnerable to the rain? Are they? It's, it's just something to think about for installation to make sure that they're not going to be knocked. If it's a children's museum, it's going to get knocked, right? Uh, depending on how you mount it and, and where you put it. Uh, touch emulation. So we differentiate between gestures and touch emulation. Gestures is a gesture, you're doing something. Touch emulation is what you're still making the same kind of move as touch, you're just not reaching the screen. From a deployment perspective, it is similar to gesture in that there are cameras somewhere watching you. It's just you don't really have to teach for touch emulation, you just don't touch the screen. You tap and you swipe, you know, that sort of thing. The kind of use cases are similar to gesture though. It's the same idea. Simple information, kiosk, et cetera. And thus it is the same kind of challenges you need to consider about the environment. Um, you know, how far away do you need to be from the screen for the camera to detect the touch? And can you do that? Can you permit that level uh, of approach to the screen or is it too far away or, you know, that kind of thing. 
tangible objects. Uh, this is when the presence of an item and the orientation of that item on the screen can be detected. And one item can be differentiated from another. In the old days, there'd be a, literally a pattern of dots or something on each item. And the camera and the table actually saw the, the pattern of dots. And it could tell one object from another. These days, some of this technology is getting so smart, it can just see that it's a car. You know, it can just see that it's a phone. Uh, so it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, great for assisted selling, right? Uh, the sales rep is on one side of a table, you're on the other, you put an item on the table, and up comes information about that item. It's pretty awesome. Always cool at a trade show, right, or for promotions. Uh, now you're seeing it like in maybe bars or restaurants where you put a coaster down or something like that. The challenge, though, is, well, you know, how many unique items do you have? How big is your catalog? Because that determines the number of tagged items you have. And depending on the platform and the requirements to differentiate one object from another could be a challenge. It's how many items are you trying to support here? Two or 202? Uh, and what level of monitoring is there for the hardware? I mean, if you're putting stuff on a table, uh, usually if it's for tangible objects, they've done something to prevent the moisture damage. but People can drop things on it. They can leave jackets on it. You know, there's things. How monitored is it? Is it, is it a consideration you need to have? Smartphone is a remote control. This is a relatively new uh, option in the field, conceptually. Great idea. So I'm using my mobile device to manipulate an on-screen cursor. And I drag my cursor. I tap what I want to tap. Uh, some of these solutions are now in coming up with a way to swipe as well. Uh, you just scan a QR code. I got the little touchpad on my phone and I'm manipulating stuff on the screen. Uh, good anytime touch alternatives are welcome. Again, you can't really do complicated stuff. It could be a little tough in a little three inch display to manipulate items on a 25 inch screen. So uh, you need to be a little careful about the UI, but you know, anytime touch alternatives are welcome, this could be interesting because I'm using my own phone. Uh, will everybody have a phone? I mean, if it's a music concert, a lot of concerts, well, when they existed, they were taking your phone and putting in a pouch. You couldn't hold it. Well, you're not doing this there because nobody has a phone. Uh, and then depending on the deployment, how reliable is network connectivity? Because by and large, your phone is communicated with something in the cloud, which then com uh, communicates with the screen. Can you depend on that connection? Is there a lot of data transfer involved in that? Are people going to be worried about that? And, and I don't have it here, but some people might be just skeeved out by the idea that they're scanning something and are you putting a virus on my phone? It, it could be something you might at least want to message about. Uh, workflow automation, this is a pretty interesting one. Uh, this is about use of an automation infrastructure, sort of a third party infrastructure to create if then relationships between some human triggered event and on-screen content. If you look at the right, you can see some examples. Um, so, for example, a bottom left, 15 minutes before a meeting starts, send a message to my CMS, to my signage. So the automation infrastructure is connecting the notion of a 15 minutes to the meeting with your signage. It's connecting two different services, which is pretty cool. And, the, and we've identified, there's actually tons of companies, when you look at the poster, that are doing this sort of thing. Uh, some cool uses right now that might make sense are social media walls where people might post things and then show up on your screen. Some level of participatory engagement where you instruct them to do something here and it causes something to happen uh, on the screen. Uh, I added alerts here, which is interesting. So the, the, the human triggered event is maybe just staff saying uh, everybody out or something like that. And it triggers a message on screen that causes it to happen. So it's this cool notion of an automation infrastructure. Um, you do depend on network connectivity. By definition, you're connecting two disparate services that are for sure hosted in different places. There's a network connection there. Can you depend on that? How reliable is it? Uh, probably going to involve mobile phones. If it's for a, a general audience, probably involving mobile phones. Will they have it? What you're asking them to do, will they be comfortable doing that? Uh, and you are depending on a third service. You're depending on the middleman to connect the two services. You're also, that middleman is another dependency. It's another link in the chain. Are you comfortable depending on another link in the chain or do you want to reduce, reduce the number of dependencies? QR codes, it's not in the poster, but it is a kind of interaction. It's something we all should consider. It enables people to scan that code and get stuff on their phone, typically a URL. 
Uh, in the old days, you had to run a QR code app. Uh, with modern phones, you just show the camera and it can tell it's a QR code. And you, know, you don't have to be educated that much to do it. I don't have to tell you, you know, why QR codes are interesting. It's about taking home information or looking at menus or voting. I don't mean for president necessarily, but just, you know, maybe a webinar or something. Still, not everybody's comfortable with QR code. They may not know it very well. They may be unfamiliar. Can you depend on that? How important is it that everybody understands? And you need a mobile phone to do it. Uh, I think this is uh, just two more, mouse and keyboard. You know what it is, you know why it's cool, <laughs> you know? I mean, the main reason not to do it is it's old fashioned, um, but accessibility is a good reason to consider it. Again, depending on how you've mounted that screen, maybe you wanna have a keyboard for people that can't reach the screen, right? That's a good modern reason, a modern incentive, uh, let alone precision and privacy. And finally, uh, haptic. Now, this is interesting because this is machine to human interaction, really, but it requires touch. It's, it's transmitting a sense of texture to swept fingers. Isn't that cool? And so you can feel pattern. You can touch uh, uh, texture with your finger as you swipe it across. This is machine to human, not human to machine, but the human must interact in order to get that sense of feeling. Lots of deployments. There's no notion of texture. You don't need haptic but it is out there and uh, cool to consider. Great, so that is my uh, kind of run through of the different interactivity categories. Uh, I hope that was helpful. I'm mindful of the time. I wanna leave some time for questions as well. Stefan, why don't you join me? There have been some questions. So I'll take a look at those and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, oh, by the way, I just got an interesting point that some haptic technology, it's in the air, uh, which I guess I knew now that I think about it, but you don't have to literally touch the screen, which is kind of freaky, but cool. Uh, so I'm looking, Stefan, can the sensor capture data be connected to cloud-based systems for downstream triggers? Can you chain triggers, I think, Stefan, is the idea. Certainly, it's a good, I'm sure there's good use cases for that, right? I'm sure you can. I'm, um, it, it really depends on, on response times if you want to use the cloud um, to, to process that data. Um, so, for example, in uh, voice inter interactions, you typically have very, very limited time um, to generate a response. Um, so, it, it really depends whether you can actually use the cloud um, for, for generating the, these triggers of, or if you have to do that uh, on the edge. That's a good point, is the round trip time, which, which is also relevant for things like the workflow automation I mentioned. Uh, what is that round trip time? Because if it's very long, that's a bad experience. I think they used to say for websites, if it didn't load in at least five seconds, you just lost a website visitor. I don't know what it is for the screen, but if I do something on the screen and I have to wait five seconds for it, I probably lost the person. Yeah, it's, it's it's rather milliseconds than uh, seconds. <laughs> that's right. That's I'm sure that's true. Yes, it should be a milliseconds. Uh, let's see. Any discussions for disclosure? Even when not asking the user full disclosure. Uh, th there's a question. I think I'm interpreting this correct. Which is, um, is there some le is there a is there a legal requirement in at any point, Stefan? You would know this better than me. So there's the anonymity aspect, and are we collecting personal information? But beyond that, is there any requirement to uh, expose what you're doing in order to collect information? If I have a camera that's passively collecting information, it's anonymous, do I still have a responsibility to disclose that? Uh, really depends uh, on, on the country you're doing that. Uh, there are some countries where you're uh, legally obliged, if you're using a camera, to um, actually put up a sign that you're using cameras even though you're just uh, ge uh, generating anonymous data um, so over here in Europe um, you have that kind of uh, issue but uh, in general I think it's it's a very good idea to be very upfront and explicit about why you're collecting the data what you're using it for because that builds trust for the user and that that's more important than any legal requirements it's that element of trust and that you're not collecting anything that's uh and you have to provide some value against the data you're collecting and if you get that trade-off right um you should be able to communicate that 
because then it's it's a fair trade-off for for the user for the consumer um so for me it's uh, more about uh the trust elements uh, than about legal element, but there, there certainly is uh, legal elements to that as well in, in some countries. Yeah, I mean, there's infinite varieties of deployments and the level of information you're collecting and how much that impacts the screen in real time and how much the, the person is aware of it. Uh, but it's absolutely true. I mean, you wouldn't have people make a, a purchase with a credit card on a wall mounted display, right? That would be uh, very poor uh, with regard to privacy, right? Well, this is just another level of that about data collection, where is it going and how is it being used? So it's a good question, it, it depends. Even if it's anonymous, if there's any sense that that data is gonna be used in some way, there might be value to uh, establishing that trust. Uh, let's see, I'm reading the question, Stefan, let's see. Um, where's the data stored? So there was just a question about where's the analytics data stored? Um, I know what I can say about computer vision, and in particular, typically it, it depends on the, the technology. Some can be processed in an offline environment. There's no need to talk to the cloud. For others, there's some sort of dependency on that cloud. Um, you can choose, some solutions are anonymous by definition. Others, it's something you can choose to do. Um, from an analytics perspective, eventually it's getting in the cloud, has to be, right? If I have multiple devices, I need to collate that data, combine them, so I'm in the cloud at some point. Um, but Alternatively, I suppose you go out every way to say we are not collecting data, right? This is this, we are not doing that here, and it's another example of establishing that trust. Yeah. And to, uh, to your point of, of the, yeah. the cameras, um, I, there, there's a GDPR legal um, perspective to that. Um, so, and, uh, for most of the technologies I know uh, that can be used over here in Europe, um, all the processing, uh, picture processing has to be done on camera on site. You can't send any pictures across to the cloud. It's just not allowed. And most clients wouldn't accept it because um, you can't guarantee privacy over, uh, over those connections. And then there's also a data volume um, aspect to that. You don't want to uh, send video streams off to the cloud because you need a lot of bandwidth for that. Um, so for, for all the uh, computer vision solutions, most of them or all of them um, actually do the um, processing of video feeds um, locally. There's an interesting question here, Stefan. I, I, have you seen the use of pens in public places for touchscreens, for example, where it's supplied? I've seen things you can buy for yourself to tap a screen without touching it, but have you ever seen it the other way around where it's supplied in some way? Is that done? In, in corporate in, uh, environments, that's uh, pretty, pretty normal. I mean, think about Samsung Flip, for example, so um, virtual or uh, digital flip uh, charts. Um, and that it's uh, much more convenient, actually, to, to use a pen to write on a, on a whiteboard. So that's the typical, typical thing where I see um, pens used uh, for, for interactions, uh, less so in, in any um, retail environment because they tend to get lost. Um, but that, that again, we can use it as, as a giveaway, basically. Trade shows, yeah, that's right. I, I would say that I think you understand our, our position on touch. It's not going anywhere. Um, sanitizer stations are, are pretty, I think that's a good idea to at least have it somewhere visible within range of a screen. Yes, pens are one way to distance yourself, but for the reasons we discussed, I don't know how realistic that is. But to make sure people recognize that, don't worry about it, you can always clean your hands after, that's a good idea. It is, yeah. I think the sanitizer station business is gonna boom. <laughs> <laughs> but san sanitizer uh, stations are very interesting because um, people tend to sanitize their, their hand to clean their hands before they use the screen, not after. And what you should do is actually use the screen and then clean your hands because uh, that's when you have all the uh, germs on, on, on your fingers. And uh, the other problem is that uh, it can destroy, depending on the technology you use, you're using, um, it can destroy your uh, interactive um, layer on, on the screen. So you have to be a bit uh, careful there, which kind of uh, sanitizer you're using. We, we have a question. Uh, if people don't mind, we, we've hit the, the, the stopping point, but if people still have questions and they're hanging around, stuff, I don't know about you, we can give it a couple more minutes, I think. Um, yeah. There was a question about our personal experience with, with these touch alternatives. Speaking for myself, speaking for Intuaface, that's our business's interactivity. 
Uh, you can use interface for passive, you know, broadcast signage, but our value prop is that interactivity. So yeah, by definition, we have experience with these things. Um, and frankly, my content was based on that experience. It's, it's based on our exposure. Uh, at the end of the day, technology continues to improve, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Uh, its level of accuracy and its ability to withstand environmental uh, uh, complications. And so uh, the best we can do is tell you, well, what is it? What are the reasons to consider or, or not consider? And then you need to evaluate it, you know, for yourself. I don't even have a different thought about that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's what you're saying. Um, I've seen many, many, many uh interactive applications, uh, non-touch. And what I love about them is that they um, allow novel ways of interacting. So it's, it really uh, gives us a lot more uh, ways to, to do an interaction. But I've, I've, all, uh, I've also seen very uh, poor implementations, uh, wrong technology, um, where you basically get no usage at all. And uh, then you ask yourself, is it really worth it? Because it, it costs money to, to develop to deploy, um, and uh, so it's, it's always a bit sad um, if you see concepts that, that are just poorly implemented or poorly thought through. Yeah, th that's a good point. You know, it occurs to me that to a certain extent, the failed deployment is not the technology's fault, right? I mean, if you understand what can the technology do, what are its limits, and you respect those limits, you could have a very successful deployment. If you don't really embrace and understand those limits and it fails, it, it might be your fault. You know, it's just you didn't use it in the right way. It was deployed improperly in some way. Um, so you, you take some responsibility. I'm not lecturing here, but you know, you, you need to take some responsibility for its proper use. There, there was a question about case studies, Stefan. You know, the thing about case studies is all of these vendors have their own case studies, and they're gonna tell you why their technology is better than any other in their category and better than all the other categories. And it's not you know, for me <laughs> to question that. Um, so you're gonna have lots of data supporting everything. I, I've always joked that uh, people will say, can we have a case study, can we have a reference? And I'd say, yes, let me get you something that says we're wonderful and everybody else is terrible. There's my case study, you know. So uh, with the case studies are nice to the extent that you understand what people did, but I don't know how accurate they give you an unbiased, objective perspective on what could be right for you. Because again, it depends on the project and what you want to do. I don't know if you have another thought about that, Stefan. But... No, I, I think you, you'll find tons of them um, out there. I and mean, we we travel the world um, actually to to show uh, installations, to, to show things. So just uh, look look at up on, on our side on, on Invitus DE. Um, but and you, you, as you said, it's um, all vendors will have case studies on, on their uh, pages. Um, so it's it's just a really matter of, uh, of looking uh, the, the web um, and um, find examples. But uh, take those as really what they are as examples, but come up with your own solution. And I can tell you, I mean, Stefan is right. Invitus. They have lots of, uh, of, of events and publications about these things in the real world. And typically, I think you guys are pretty honest. It, this worked, this didn't work, you know. Uh, and so it, they're, they're a very good resource for that kind of exposure, to see it in the real world, in the jungle, and, and see how it's doing. Uh, there's one other question. Uh, environmental sensors uh, could be more powerful. I'm not sure I understand the question, Yannick, to be honest. Um, it, every environmental sensor, you know, is picking up what it's looking for, and you can choose to use it or not. Um, uh, those are all the questions, Stefan. I don't know if you have any final comments, or we can uh, we can wrap this up. I think well, it was. Uh, thank you for your initiative on that, Geoff. Um, I think it's a great one, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to receiving feedback um, on technologies we might have missed, on companies we might have missed, because um, it's just such an exciting um, field, and uh, I, we, we love this stuff, and uh, really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, it's our pleasure to work with you. We are excited to do it. I'm excited to see you know, how this grows. As I mentioned, it's our intention, both in Tuaface and Invitus, we're going to maintain this. Certainly, there's going to be annual updates. Uh, this, uh, we joke that uh, this poster should outlive our professional careers. That would be, that would be great if we can accomplish that. Um, 
and I plan to work a little while longer, so there, there's that. Um, okay, I thought there might be another question, but we're good. So I thank you very much for your time and attention. Everybody, this record, this session has been recorded. We will post it as well. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.